last October I decided to celebrate Halloween by playing through the first three Five Nights at Freddy's games. I'd never played any of them before, but I generally had a good time, and I decided to play the rest this year. Well, the time has come, so enough stalling. Let's dive into the last, from a certain point of view, of the FNAF games. Going into FNAF 4, there were only two things that I was really aware of. The entire game relies heavily on audio cues, and the ending gave us a famous Markiplier meme. The game opens with an 8-bit section where we play as a small child locked in their room. It's not really clear what's going on just yet, but that's par for the course for the series. After that ends, the game proper starts with us in, presumably, the same child's bedroom. We have a right door and a left door to manage in true FNAF fashion, though instead of checking to see if one of the animatronics came to visit, we have to listen for any sounds of breathing. If we hear it, we shut the door for a few seconds until they move away. And if we don't hear anything, we can use our flashlight to see if anything's in the hallway. Though doing that with an animatronic at the door will end our night early. The room also features a closet and a bed that we'll have to track. The closet doesn't matter for right now, though that did take me a while to figure out. And the bed gets an increasing number of tiny Freddies on it that we can clear by shining the flashlight on them. It's a lot to manage, but like every night one in the series, there's nothing much to worry about, so we breathe through it pretty quickly. We get another 8-bit section where we find out the crying child's brother is a bit of a bully. That brings us to something unique with this game, the fun with plush trap sections. There's a pretty simple trick to beating them, and getting it right shaves two hours off your first attempt on the next night, but more on that later. Night two is where the real fun begins. I spend way too much time checking the closet still, though the only things that matter at this moment are the bed and the sounds of the animatronics moving around the hallways. It's a real departure from how the franchise has been up to this point, but I have to say I'm enjoying the more hearing-focused gameplay. With some practice and a bit of focus, you can accurately track who's moving where in the house. Hearing them at the door, however, can be tough, especially with Chica. Twice. Third time's the charm, though, and I clear the night for another 8-bit section. It seems like the child is scared of Freddy as well, so I really have to wonder why he's at the pizzeria in the first place. Still, I do feel bad for the kid. We'll find out more later, but for now, it's off to our next plush trap section. The trick with these is to shine your light on the third set of slow steps. Here, you should be able to hear what I mean. You do lose the shorter night if you die, but of course that never happens. With night three underway, I finally need to worry about Foxy. He'll sprint around the house looking for an opening before diving into your closet. The game does make it obvious when he's in, so after that point, you'll just need to check the closet periodically and shut the door in his face. The night takes a few more tries thanks to a certain chicken, but we manage to get through without too much trouble. In the next 8-bit section, we find out that the crying child's birthday is coming up. At the pizzeria he's terrified of, no less. The brother's behavior feels on the extreme side, but not unrealistically so. I definitely knew people who lashed out like this when I was a kid. That brings us to Night 4, which in other games was always the night I got stuck on the most. Your typical Night 4 cranks up the difficulty to make sure that you have the mechanics down solidly before the final night. I actually got stuck on this night for a while, mostly because my ears started struggling, until I was pointed toward something that might help. Loudness equalization. It's a sound setting on your computer that makes the quiet sounds louder and the loud sounds quieter. Finally, I don't need to rupture my eardrums to hear Chica breathing. It's no silver bullet solution, but it helped me quite a bit, since after another try or two, I finally finished the night. Night 5 changes up the mechanics pretty significantly. We trade the normal cast of animatronics for Nightmare Fredbear. He sprints around the house and we have to run to the door that he's at, flash the light to see if he's there, and close the door as soon as we can if he is. But that's not all he does. If you hear him laugh, he probably just teleported either to the closet or the bed. You have barely enough time to check both, so if you hesitate at the door and guess wrong, you die. Despite all of that, I'd say this night is far easier than night four. Once you get the hang of the mechanics, only having the single animatronic to deal with means that your focus can be entirely on that. I managed to get through the night in only three tries. With that done, we reach the cutscene from the infamous meme. It's a brutal scene that sets up a lot of what's going to happen in the games to come. It's also where we're going to close the book on this game for now. 
Technically, there are two more nights after this and some challenges, but none of it's really necessary to understand the story, at least as much as it can be. And we still have two more games to talk about. Overall, I enjoyed the mechanics of FNAF 4 a lot. The hearing focus was a nice change of pace, and it hit that sweet spot of being challenging while not having too much frustrating RNG. I may come back to the challenge modes later, but that'll be for another time. For now, let's really change things up. Sister Location has the dubious honor of being the game after which I fell off following the franchise. By 2016, I felt like I'd started to see FNAF everywhere, and I kind of burned out on it. I'd catch back up a few years later, and I do want to stress that it wasn't the game itself that made me fall off. Playing this one for the first time, I did run into a bit of a snag, though. This game, and the next one, both can't run on the current generation of AMD graphics drivers, at least at the time of writing. It's a strange issue to have, but I've also started having a similar issue with Old School RuneScape, so I guess this is just my life now. If there's any weirdness with the footage, I'm going to chalk that up to the fact that I recorded this all on a different computer than usual. But enough about that, let's get into the game. Starting up a fresh game, we hear an unnamed child's voice before taking a sharp turn into humor. There's a noticeable shift in this game from the fairly somber tones of the first four to what I've heard described as lol random internet humor. I see what you were trying to type, and I will autocorrect it for you. One moment. Welcome, Eggs Benedict. It definitely ties this game to a specific point in time, and for the most part the humor didn't land for me. Some of it definitely did, but we'll get to that in a bit. Night 1 is always very easy. There's not much for us to do other than follow the instructions from Hand Unit, our friendly narrator. We check the stages and shock the animatronics back into compliance. Once that's done, there's nothing else for us to do but to go home and shovel popcorn into our mouths. For as much as I'm not big on the other humor, I have to admit I do really like the sitcom parody that plays between each night. There's just something about it I find charming. Night 2 gets off to a running start when Hand Unit changes the voice setting to Angsty Teen. The start of the night is the same, but after the second stage, the voice hits an error and needs to change back. It seems the shock button at the Circus Baby area isn't working, so Hand Unit tries to reboot the system. As you might imagine, rebooting the system sets some pretty dangerous stuff free, and Circus Baby herself hops on the intercom to tell us to hide. She's basically the face animatronic for the game, the same way Freddy was for the first two, and we'll be spending a lot of time talking to her. We duck into the empty space under the desk and hold it closed until the danger passes. So far so good, but that's only half the night. Once that's done, Baby gets back on the intercom to warn us that Hand Unit is going to give us bad directions that we need to ignore, and she gives us better ones. I see no reason not to trust an animatronic after the last four games, so we decide to do what she says. It turns out that we need to reset the power grid manually, which means that we'll need to cross Ballora's gallery. She can't see us, but she can hear us, so we just crawl across the floor and stop when we start to hear her music. It seems you are taking a long time. Please proceed as quickly and as quietly as possible. Lovely. In the room with the power grid is Funtime Freddy, and we need to reset everything without him noticing us. It took me an embarrassing number of attempts to figure it out, but what that means is play an audio clip until he's back on stage and the danger meter is green. Just do that between every reset and you'll be golden. Once it's done, we take a leisurely stroll back through Ballora's gallery and head home to a well-earned bowl of popcorn. Night 3 is quite a bit more forgiving. It starts with us walking across Funtime Foxy's room. The whole place is pitch black, but we're given what's basically a camera flash to see. Foxy tracks movements, so it's just a game of red light, green light. A flash every few few steps, with stopping the instant Foxy shows up, works every time. Next comes parts and service, because apparently this night guard job also includes regular maintenance work. For my money, this is the creepiest part of the game. The harsh light, combined with being so up close and personal with something the game trains you to view as a threat, is just unsettling. And there's also this. Most of the process is just a listening check, though the final step with catching the Bonnie Hand puppet is tricky. Once it's all done, we head back through Foxy's room to a mandatory jump scare. Sadly, there will be no popcorn for us tonight. We wake up sometime later in a springlock suit while Baby monologues at us. Welcome to the infamous Night 4. This night asks you to do something that is on paper very simple. Keep these ten springs wound while tiny hell goblins climb up the side. If they reach the top, you lose but bumping them off the side unwinds the springs. Good luck! 
This section had to be nerfed not long after the game was released, and honestly, I get why. I barely made it through this version of the night as it was. But I did make it through and back home for the best bowl of popcorn ever, along with my favorite episode of the sitcom. The final night sends us back to parts and service to deal with Baby. She tells us she's done something terrible and needs to be scooped. It's similar to the Freddy one on night three, though this keypad part is way more precise than you'd expect. You also only have a second or two to enter the numbers after she reads them out. But we eventually get there and she leads us to the scooping room. The wrong end of it, to be precise. It turns out that this whole thing was in fact a deception. The real plan is that we're going to get scooped and the animatronics are going to use us as a skin suit to leave the facility undetected. I'll admit I didn't care for this ending the first time I saw it, but it's grown on me as a properly bleak ending for a horror story like this. And this is the ending the rest of the series is going to carry on from, so I think it's time to move on to the next game. But there is one question I have remaining. What did Baby do that was so terrible? Well, the answer to that is in the minigame that pops up occasionally after you die, or that you can access from the extras menu. To beat the minigame, you have to deliver cupcakes to all of the children, and take some ice cream from the last screen to the first. And it is frustratingly precise. There are exactly enough cupcakes spread across three pickups to feed every child, but picking up new ones overrides the ones you have currently. That means you need to precisely jump over two different pickups and backtrack to them later, in addition to making basically no mistakes on the platforming. And if you die, you have to start the whole thing over again. I've heard the mobile version adds 20 seconds to the timer, but I'm playing on PC so I finish with two seconds to spare. And we get an answer to the question from the top in the most FNAF way possible. Yikes. Sister Location is a notable turning point for the franchise. It's the game that shifted from straight horror to more horror comedy, and it's also the game that started to really push the story to the forefront. But I also feel like it's the one that struggles most to have an identity. There are so many different mechanics packed into this one game that it almost doesn't feel like it belongs in the same franchise. I can't really see myself coming back to this one, mostly because that would mean having to replay Night 4 but I certainly didn't hate my time with it. The next game, though, is one I've been really looking forward to talking about. FNAF Pizzeria Simulator is both more and less experimental than Sister Location, and I kind of love it for that. It opens with a silly pizza-throwing minigame that glitches out in round four, then switches to what looks like a job interview for my new personal sleep paralysis demon, before ending with a franchisee introduction video for Fazbear Entertainment. And while I may not have been a big fan of the humor in the last game, I've spent enough time working an office job to get a laugh out of the tongue-in-cheek corporate parody. With all that out of the way, we get started with a business sim. Each day in-game is divided into two parts. The business sim day sections and the more traditional defend the office night sections. During the day, you can buy items to help improve your restaurant's performance and boost your FAS rating. At certain rating thresholds, you earn a bit of money. You can also playtest some of the things you can buy, which also improves your FAS rating, and is going to be your main method of getting money for the first couple of days. I won't go over everything, but the general strategy is to use the Trash Pals and the single sponsorship deal to get yourself the Midnight Motorist cabinet. It's easy to get a lot of points through the game, so it's useful for grinding money, and it's also the first minigame with some lore to it. Driving through the hole in the course on lap 4 leads to an 8-bit section. That heavily implies you can add an abusive father to the list of things the kid from FNAF 4 had to deal with. After grinding Midnight Motorist for a bit, we can pick up Fruity Maze. It's a lot like Pac-Man, if Pac-Man got creepier every time you beat it. Beating this one enough gets us a short scene of a familiar face up to no good. So if you've ever wondered how bad William Afton was, he's lure a child to her death with promise of seeing her dead dog again levels of bad. After using the rest of our play tokens, it's time for the first night section. On the whole, the night sections are very RNG dependent, and there are two different strategies I'll be using for them. They're both ones that have been floating around the community for several years, but I'll go more in depth when I get there. In the meantime, let's look at exactly what the nights involve. Rather than the set timers of previous games, we have a set number of tasks to complete before we log off for the night. That means, to an extent, the time each night takes is up to us. However, we have to manage two vents that animatronics will approach the office from. Everything we do causes noise, and if they hear us and we aren't looking at the vent they're in, they'll come and say hello. We can turn off the PC and the fan to reduce the noise, but having the fan off increases the heat. 
If it gets too high, we'll pass out and have to do the night over, so we need to balance getting our tasks done with not getting got by the animatronics and not overheating. The first night, though, has no animatronics, so we finish in no time. That takes us to our third phase of every day. Once the night phase is done, we'll have the chance to salvage an animatronic that someone left in the alley behind the pizzeria. We'll get some money for salvaging them successfully, but being an animatronic in a FNAF game, they're very aggressive. During the salvage process, you'll need to watch them carefully to see if they move. If they move too much, shock them with the taser. But not too often, as any shock past the third reduces the amount of money you get for them. I'm going for the true ending, so we'll be salvaging every one we can. The first one with Molten Freddy here goes just fine, and we get a nice sum for the salvage and our performance for the day. On the next day, we're able to pick up the side stage so we can start getting achievements. There are a few bonuses you can get for having complete sets of animatronics on stage at the same time, and the item we need for the third lore minigame costs twelve and a half thousand dollars, so we need all the help we can get. Our night phases now have animatronics to deal with. The number depends on how many we salvage, or buy at a discount if you ignore the warning. So let's go over the first strategy for dealing with them. I've come to call this one the Brain Dead Strategy, and I was first made aware of it in a Backseat Streams video. Basically, the whole strategy is to drop an audio lure on the far middle tile on one side of the map and stare at the other side, looking at your PC only to start another task or when an ad forces you to. That's it. That's the whole plan. The lure has a 50% chance to pull any animatronic in its range to it, so it's very RNG dependent. It's enough to get me through this night, though, and we're off to the Afton salvage. My, how the mighty have fallen. Nothing particularly notable happens this time, so we move on to the next day with a nice sum of money. At this point, I'm tired of grinding Midnight Motorist, so I decide to change to a different game. I've never been great at Gradius-style games, but I do well enough with this one to really start upgrading the restaurant. After another thoroughly uneventful night phase, it's time for the actual Scrap Baby salvage. There's something about the way she stares at you right before she's about to attack I find really unnerving. Scott Cawthon and the team did a great job with the character designs in this game. The next day, I get impatient and make a mistake. There's an animatronic by the name of Lefty you can pick up for $5, a fact that should already be sending up all sorts of red flags. If you buy Lefty at any point prior to his salvage, he joins the night phases early and makes things so much harder. You also lose out on the chance to salvage him later, but buying him now gets me enough money for the security puppet and the associated minigame. The first three times you play the game, you're told to stop any children with a green band from leaving, but none show up. On the fourth time you do, you see a child with a green band already outside. Oops. Also, someone put a present on the lid to try to trap the puppet, but that's not going to stop them. Unfortunately, it's raining outside, which the puppet was not designed to handle. And double unfortunately, the child's already dead. The puppet collapses on top of them as the minigame comes to an end. When this series wants to, it can deliver some strong emotional moments. Despite having Lefty early, the next night phase is also uneventful. And that's the last time I'll be able to say that in this video. Two remaining night phases are by far the hardest nights I had in the entire series. All four animatronics are active, all four are angry, and I ended up having to switch strategies after I died about 20 times. Instead, I had to use what I'm going to dub the actually trying strategy, which I first saw in a video from The Bones 5. There's a much more in-depth breakdown in that video, but the Sparks Notes version is that after every task, you shut everything down, shine your flashlight in each vent for four seconds after the two icons reappear, turn them back on, and repeat. It takes a bit of practice, but after a few more tries, I managed to make it through the night. There are no more salvages and nothing really left to do during the day, so I hop right into the final night phase. It's another brutal one, and despite my best efforts, the new strategy stops working. Eventually, out of sheer frustration, I switch back to the original strategy. Two attempts later, the game served me up perfect RNG. No animatronics, no ads, just a clean run where I'm in and out in 2 minutes and 20 seconds. What follows is, in my opinion, a perfect ending for the franchise. Every lingering thread is tied up in an amazing monologue that sounds like something ripped straight from an episode of The Twilight Zone. For most of you, I believe there is peace, and perhaps more, waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, friend. This is where the franchise should have ended, I think. 
but I do get why it didn't. And with that, we've come to the end of the FNAF series, or at least my coverage of it. Of the remaining games, I don't feel like I'd have much to say about FNAF World. I don't own a VR headset for the Help Wanted games, and Security Breach... Alright, I'd cover Security Breach if people really want me to. I do feel like there could be something interesting to say about that one. Though, just a heads up, there would be a lot of, can you believe they released it like this, too. Ultimately, I'm glad I played through the series. For as many years as I've pointed to it as an example of the kind of success and creativity indie gaming is capable of, playing something is very different than just watching it. If I had to rank the games, FNAF 4 and Pizza Sim would be in an awkward, tied-for-first situation. Those two are the ones I'd feel like I might replay sometime in the future. After that comes FNAF 2, Sister Location, FNAF 1, and lastly, FNAF 3. To those of you who made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching. This was the last of the three things I'd promised myself I'd cover this year, so it's a relief to have it done. And be sure to tune in next time when we take an in-depth look at a game that I've covered previously. But for now... Connection terminated.